Um, our next session is, as you can see, Enhancing Search and Discovery for LGBTQIA plus materials at the Orbis Cascade Alliance and beyond, uh, a tour of the Homosaurus Implementation Project. Um, this will be presented by Crystal uh, Irigui and Rose Kraus. Um, Crystal is a metadata librarian and co-interim head of the Metadata and Cataloging Initiatives Unit at the University of Washington Libraries in Seattle. She focuses on the intersections of linked data, descriptive metadata practices, and entity management in GLAMS. Rose is metadata librarian and professor at Eastern Washington University in Cheney, Washington. She previously served as curator of special collections at the Northwest Museum of Arts and Culture in Eastern Washington State, sorry, at the Eastern Washington State Historical Society, and as a project director for oral history projects. She <laughs> is the EWU Library's subject librarian for art and moonlights in the archives and special collections department. Um, whenever you're ready, take it away. Thank you. Um... Hello, I'm Crystal Yuragi, and I am last year's chair of the Orbis Cascade Alliance Cataloging Standing Group, or the CSG, as we like to call it. And my co-presenter, Rose Krauss, is one of the group's fabulous co-chairs this year. The CSG started a Homosaurus implementation project last year, which we're really excited to share with you today because it's improving access to our LGBTQ plus resources is expanding the Homosaurus vocabulary itself and has gotten our entire consortial library community involved in inclusive cataloging work. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Rose who will tell you a bit about the Alliance and the Homosaurus and will give you a brief history of the project so far, including the education and training that we developed for our volunteers. Thanks, Crystal. Um, next slide, please. All right, so the Orbis Cascade Alliance, which we'll refer to variously as OCA or The Alliance, is a consortium of 38 academic libraries in the Pacific Northwest. The Alliance runs a shared library management system and discovery interface. We use Ex Libris Alma and Primo. The Alliance also facilitates collective purchasing of library resources, coordinates resource sharing for our members, and supports management and access to unique and local collections. The Cataloging Standing Group, or CSG, at the Alliance is made up of staff from member libraries who coordinate shared projects, monitor and advise on cataloging and metadata trends, recommend updates to Alliance documentation and practices, and collaborate with other areas in the Alliance to enhance resource management, discovery, and sharing. The Homosaurus is an international linked data vocabulary focused on LGBTQ terms used by libraries, archives, museums, and other institutions. It's a companion vocabulary to the broader subject vocabularies such as LCSH uh, that is meant to enhance discovery for LGBTQ resources. Next slide. In January of 2023, the Alliance developed the ability to display non-LCSH and non-MESH subject headings in our discovery layer premium. Concurrently, I believe, worldcat.org also enhanced display of vocabularies in their interface. The fact that Alliance users could now see Homosaurus terms in records in the public interface revealed the unevenness of the vocabulary's application for existing resources and a less than optimum search experience. And just as a reminder, Homosaurus was first authorized for MARC record subject term use in October of 2019, only five years ago. Next slide, please. In order to start exploring solutions to the unevenness of the data in the records, in the spring of 2023, the CSG invited Adrian Williams from the University of Kentucky to deliver multi-session trainings on how they have implemented Homosaurus in their work. Building off that training series, the CSG decided to take action to retrospectively enhance targeted bibliographic records at the bibliographic utility level, in our case, OCLC, uh, WorldCat. 
which enhanced not only our consortial catalog records, but the records of any library using OCLC as their source for records. Folks contributing to this project included not only trained catalogers, but other library staff, students, and volunteers across the Alliance. Next slide, please. The CSG felt strongly that it was important to be as inclusive as possible in terms of who could participate in the project. We knew there were non-cataloging staff who were very interested in enhancing bibliographic data, so the search and discovery experience was improved for them as users and as teachers of our discovery systems. To that end, we developed two what we call pipelines, A and B. A is for folks with OCLC editing privileges, and B is for those without OCLC editing privileges, um, and also in situations where there might need to be PCC level editing done on a record. Next slide, please. So the CSG developed training and documentation for both of those these pipelines and trained over 50 project volunteers. These trainings were recorded and are available on our project webpage. And I can insert a link in the chat in just a second here. Um, our Homosaurus training and FAQ page, which was first developed by the previous year's CSG members, includes answers to questions, links to our trainings, thank you, Crystal, and links to additional resources. And we have a link to that as well, thank you. All of these resources are freely available to anyone with an interest in the project. CSG members also held drop-in sessions for participants to get help and ask questions informally. And we developed a project listserv to aid communication for the project. Now I'll pass it over to Crystal to get into the nitty gritty of the project processes, workflows, and communication. Thanks, Rose. So we borrowed the start of our workflow um, from Adrian Williams, our trainer at the University of Kentucky Libraries. We took batches of records, which were assigned the term sexual minorities or non-monogamous relationships in LCSH from our shared consortial catalog and targeted those as our starting point. From there, we designed a shared Google Sheet, which would serve as a central workspace for all project volunteers. Earlier today, I think I heard the phrase um, spreadsheets for the win, and spreadsheets really are great. Um, Target records were extracted from ALMA into the tracking sheet where volunteers can self-select records, perform subject analysis, and record their work. Pipeline B participants look up records in a version of Primo created specifically for them by Blake Galbraith at Washington State University, which is very generous, perform subject analysis using the Homosaurus, and put suggested Homosaurus additions into the tracking sheet. Then they indicate that the record is ready for cataloger review and move on to the next record. Pipeline A volunteers do the same things, and they're also tasked with reviewing and implementing the work of Pipeline B participants in OCLC Connection. When project participants find that they need new or revised Homosaurus terms, they propose these terms um, and record that work in a tab on the tracking spreadsheet. There are multiple avenues for suggesting new terms to the Homosaurus editorial board. Instructions for either using the Slack method of proposal or the contact form on the Homosaurus website are available to participants through our documentation. And the same tracking sheet workflow applies for our SACO proposals in coordination with the Library of Congress SACO Gender and Sexuality Funnel Project. Um, and then a CSG member follows up with members of the SACO funnel to make sure that those um, suggestions for SACO improvements also happen. As batches of records are completed in the future, we have a tab for new batch ideas and a process for adding additional batches of records to the workflow. Participants occasionally run into records where they would like to add homosaurus terms, um, and those records are outside of the HIP project. And those are in their regular cataloging work or interactions with the library catalog. And for one reason or another, they can't enhance these records themselves. 
we put together a form for that called HIP Help, which enables project participants from any institution in our consortium to request Homosaurus enhancement to a record by project participants. Form responses auto populate into another tab on our main tracking spreadsheet where participants can work records into their regular project duties. And here is our spreadsheet in action. Um, it's rainbow and we fill in in progress or done or needs catalog or review as appropriate into the status column to reflect where a record is in the workflow. Um, sometimes we need to pull something from the shelf to do more subject analysis on it. Um, that's the case oftentimes when a record is just, it doesn't have enough information. Um, so the resource examination column gets filled out at that point. Sometimes there are permissions restrictions like Rose um, mentioned with the PCC record. Uh, so that column gets filled out. Maybe it's a concert record. Um, you can also see that we've got a lot more than just subjects in here. The Homosaurus is a really well-developed vocabulary. It's got terms for creator and audience characteristics and genre form terms, which are often appropriate for the resources that we're assessing. So we add them when it is appropriate based on local and community best practices. And the Homosaurus community of practice has been incredibly helpful in guiding us through development of these local best practices where guidance is left up to local implementers. Members of the CSG joined the Homosaurus Slack space and got in touch with members of the Homosaurus editorial board during the early planning phases of the implementation project. As the project began, the majority of our volunteers also joined the Slack space and got plugged into the email listserv. The Homosaurus community has been so welcoming. Uh, we've built a real sense of camaraderie with fellow Homosaurus implementers in Mark 21 environments in these virtual spaces and gotten outstanding support from members of the editorial board when we've come to them with questions. Our implementation practices and shared institutional knowledge have grown so much thanks to the international Homosaurus community. Answers given to questions and discovering what others are doing and discussions in shared spaces have helped spur the success of this project so far. We still have a lot of work to do and with a new year starting, Rose and her co-chair are looking at what lies ahead for the project. Thanks, Crystal. I think uh, one of the first thing that, things that lies ahead, and I added this kind of last minute to our slides, was finishing our first set of records. Um, Crystal will talk a little bit about how much time it's taken um, to actually do this work, which is um, tells us a lot about you know, what it takes to do it. So finishing our first set of records is really important. Um, there's also several areas where we see opportunities for additional impact um, outside our consortium. So these include establishing permanent cataloging workflows and practices at both our member institutions, not only for existing records, but for newly created or acquired materials, coordinating with other individuals and institutions who are doing similar work, such as developing shared best practices and training materials. And finally, advocating with metadata and library system vendors to prioritize the addition of and the display and discovery of hom homosaurus terms in catalogs and discovery systems in ways that are sustainable and user-friendly. For example, while homosaurus is a vocabulary that can be used in MARC records, uh, the ongoing term maintenance is not optimum um, in either OCLC WorldCat or in other library vendor systems. It's a very one-by-one -one process. It's not very automated. Next slide, please. Oh, that's you. <laughs> it is me. Um, so we've learned a lot of lessons. So there's a few lessons learned slides. We've learned a lot from the first year of HIP. Um, first, we learned how to protect Google Sheets rows. Uh, the lesson that we took away is that when managing a workflow with a ton of moving parts um, and lots and lots of people, it's smart to anticipate mistakes and make your workflows and tools as foolproof as possible. We also learned a little bit to some of our surprise that automating Homosaurus subject analysis is not practical. And 
as a metadata librarian and someone who uses scripts a lot, that kind of surprised me. Um, we thought that there would be a few one-to-one -one LCSH to Homosaurus translations that we could automate or that we would be able to add a few terms using batch processes, and that just didn't work out. Um, getting more hands involved and training volunteer humans in subject analysis turned out to be much more practical than using machines. And we learned that this work takes more time than we anticipated. We thought that the CSG and about 50 volunteers, so about 30 catalogers and 30 non-catalogers, would be able to complete 2,880 records in under three months. It's now been about five months since we finished our training and we finished 574 records as of last night and have 142 more in progress. So we were a little bit ambitious when it came to the numbers. We've also learned that the Homosaurus community is lovely, which we kind of already knew, but it's good to be right. Um, they're lightning fast at responding to vocabulary enhancement requests. It's incredible. Um, importantly, we learned that catalogers are not the only people who can do subject analysis well. Half of our volunteers and some of our most productive volunteers came into the project through Pipeline B. We learned that this project, um, through this project, that a lot of library staff and students and users at our consortium care enough about improving access to LGBTQ plus resources in our catalog to get their hands dirty and do the work themselves under the guidance of experienced catalogers and metadata librarians, and they're doing a great job. We've built a really cool community, which Rose will talk about now. So this project is creating what we're calling the building blocks for linkable data by populating bibliographic descriptions with terms and URIs that can be used as linked data functionality is developed and enhanced. Without these building blocks, we know that systems can't surface and connect information about entities and vocabularies across the semantic web. Next slide, please. We've expanded the vocabulary by engaging in ontology de development, including proposing 20 new or revised terms, and that's uh, just at the start uh, for the Homosaurus. In addition, this project has contributed to the development of LCSH through submission of new and revised terms through the SACO funnel for gender and sexuality, thanks to catalogers who are involved with the PCC. Next slide. And we're building a community of practice around this specific vocabulary and around concepts of linked open data, both within our consortium and with the wider Homosaurus community. And we've involved not just, quote unquote, the usual suspects of catalogers and metadata specialists, we've welcomed community members of all types to contribute in meaningful ways in improving access to LGBTQ plus materials. Next slide. As we wrap up, we wanna take a moment to acknowledge several individuals and groups who've been integral um, to this project. Um, first, the 2023-24 CSG, who in addition to Crystal and myself, developed the training and the documentation for this project. We also wanna acknowledge the leadership of Holly Wheeler at Mount Hood Community College as the CSG chair in 22-23 when this project was first envisioned. And kudos, as always, to Leslie Lowry, our program manager for technical services at the Alliance, who keeps us organized and moving forward on our projects. In addition, we want to acknowledge Adrian Williams from the University of Kentucky for helping lay the groundwork for our project, and the Homosaurus Editorial Board for their inspiration, support, training, and willingness to collaborate with us. And last but not least, we want to acknowledge all the HIT participants who are doing the work to make resources more discoverable in our systems. Next slide, please. So that wraps it up for us. Thank you for attending. We're open, open for questions and comments. And I just wanna point out that the final slide in our deck is um, a set of links to things that we've referred to during the presentation. So you can access that um, afterwards as well. So we're ready for questions and comments. Well, um, 
we got a couple of comments in the chat, uh, from two from Yujo uh, by that the workflow is really neat. And I would agree with that. I think this is a fantastic model for like just any sort of distributed subject based workflow. Um, and a gr like a great model for getting more people involved uh, in any sort of uh, descriptive or metadata or vocabulary management project. It's really it's really a ton of work to get set up. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I'm in awe too. So uh, And then I see that now we are getting a couple of questions coming in the Zoom chat. Uh, knowing more details about the limits of the automation would be interesting. Uh, so yeah. Jen. Yeah. So, Jen, we looked at, um, you know, some of the uh, some of the terms in the Homosaurus and LCSH that have the same label, for instance. Um, and we thought, oh, easy. We could just put in the Homosaurus um, URI. Uh, for these, and that would be an easy thing to automate. But then when we looked at them, um, the scope notes were different. They're not the same thing. Um, not exactly. And so we couldn't end up automating those things because they're not talking about the same group of people or they're not talking about the same exact concept. And so the vocabularies don't really, they're not applied in the same way. Um, so it didn't really work um, so well. And subject analysis for LGBTQ plus materials has not been done with much thought or care yet in cataloging. So there's nothing really to for automated processes to grab hold of. Um, if you use titles, for instance, um, you can get some funny things like, uh, you know, bears. Sometimes it's a sometimes it's a creature that lives in the forest, and sometimes it's not. So you, it's it's not an easy thing to automate, um, and we just couldn't find. We couldn't find things that lent themselves to um, to easy batch process automation like we thought that we were going to be able to. Um, so we just went with humans. Um, and then do we update all the records in OCLC for the same title? We left that up to the, the Pipeline A participants to decide. I think some Pipeline A participants just go with the things that we have holdings on at our consortium. And um, some of us go as far as like, I'll go in and merge all the records for the same things in OCLC so that, and then also go in to all the additions and add Homosaurus to all the different editions of the same work and, um, you know, go as far as possible but that makes things slower. So um, it depends on the catalog or what they feel like doing. We're not super consistent or prescriptive about it. Um, so sometimes, let me see. Um, I have a question um, in, uh, how have you gotten the institutional buy-in across the uh, alliance to kind of pursue this project, um, especially as the estimates um, and, and to sustain it, especially as you noted, uh, you, you were thinking you were going to get 5,000 uh, uh, 5, records or, or terms updated, but uh, you're still just at, you know, about the 10% mark. Um, so ha have there been conversations or pushback or any other things like that that you've had to negotiate? Well, uh, so I'll just speak for myself that um, I signed up to be a volunteer and I have not edited one record because I, we all know how this goes, right? At institutions, you end up getting other people's jobs and things. So like for me, I haven't even been able to participate because it's a bandwidth issue. So I, your point is very well taken. 
Um, but at a, so there's that issue. I think for the most part at most of the institutions in the Alliance, um, managers and directors are quite open to their staff working on this project. I think there's been a little bit of trepidation for some perhaps private and private religious institutions to work on the project. Um, not because of, I don't think it's a personal belief issue, but, um, you know, they, they have other things to navigate there. Um, so those are a couple of things that I've observed. And then Crystal works at a much larger institution. So I think she could speak more to, you know, bandwidth there. My boss asked me to do this. So it would be odd for them to push back on it now. <laughs> um, so I think our administrators would, they, they enjoy that this is happening um, at all. And I think the numbers are, um, you know, the, I think the CSG sort of set a goal for ourselves and um, benchmarks are, benchmarks are things that move. Um, so I think, yeah, institutional buy-in at the University of Washington has been high from the beginning just because it's a DEI thing. Um, Great. And there's a longer uh, question that's uh, come in from Elliot in the chats. Um, first of all, thanks for the presentation. I love how you included non-catalogers who wanted to contribute. For the Pipeline B participants, how much or at all did they need to look at the MARC records and encoding? Did you have to train them much to understand the underlying data structures or did they just do the intellectual subject analysis work? They look at Primo. So um, they look at the catalog. Um, so they have to look at the like subject headings um, from a from a user perspective, like someone who was looking at a catalog record. Um, we can probably show you if we have time. We don't, we're over time. But um, it's probably in the workflow, but it's just the normal discovery interface. But we did do quite a bit of training on, you know, what is a subject heading um, and on the basics of subject analysis. I think we had... Uh, a three part, three or four part training for each pipeline that they needed to complete. Um, but they stuck with it and are doing it. Uh, you do have time. We we have uh, till 4.30 for this session. So if you oh, get okay. I thought it was, um, I thought it was 1.15. Good. <laughs> okay. So then I could, we could show you. Um, Maybe you can show off our website. <gasps> like the That's a good idea. Oh my yeah. gosh. We could show you so many things. Okay. Um, boop. Right here. All right. So here's all of our training and it's all online. So if anyone wants to check it out um, or take any of it for yourselves, to reproduce, you are welcome to it. Um, let's see, where's our Primo instance? You go to the that hit Primo VE. Yeah. yeah. Here's what they see. So, um, yeah, they also made it rainbow for us, and it's pretty cool. So basically, they can see what should I look for. Um, I always search for things about dogs. Dogs. There's always stuff about dogs at the library. Okay. So you can look at your, here it is. You've got genre form terms, description. So this is what they're seeing. Um, subjects, dogs, juvenile literature. They also have an alternative vocabulary term. And I think that's the fast term. This is part of the yeah. different institutions have have made choices about their mm -hmm. how they will show different vocabularies in their primo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, basically, this is what they're seeing. 
um, in pipeline B. In pipeline A, we're, we're editing an OCLC. But this is all we're forcing pipeline B participants to do. Okay, well, that's, that's, so it's basically kind of like using the library catalog, but with an added layer. Yeah, just because um, not all institutions have the same materials. So we needed a primo layer that would provide access to all of the volunteers to all of the materials that were going to be um that were going to be identified in the project. So we had to set up a separate instance of Primo um, so that say, say a volunteer from, from a small community college, you know, in Eastern Oregon would be able to work on materials from the University of Washington. They wouldn't be able to access all of our materials necessarily. Um, so we needed a, we needed an instance of the catalog that would be easily accessible for everybody. Is that why we did that, Rose? Did um, I, just... I think that was part of it. And also that there was a lot of variation in every institution's primo because each institution yeah. in their consortium ha gets to decide how their primo looks. Mm -hmm. it's and we not needed standardized. Yeah. And we needed the um, Homosaurus terms to display. Right. If they were there as well. Yeah. Let's see. We have more questions and we have more time than we thought. Yeah. There are a few um, more. Um, yeah. Sonia asks, what role do non-library metadata experts play in the project and how do you incorporate their diverse perspectives? Oh, well, the pipeline B participants can be anyone. And they do lots of work. And we also, I think we forgot to mention, we set up a listserv that's just for the project. Um, and so there's a lot of discussion that happens that's just among um, HIP project participants. And everybody talks about the project amongst themselves and sets up best practices um, together. So do you have anything to add, Rose? Um, I guess the only thing I would add is that we've had um, some uh, folks who also have additional um, subject expertise. So like people who are working with medical related materials who very, very much have that particular kind of scope. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been really good to be able to get those, you know, uh, materials looked at by, by people who have uh, even more focused expertise, not so much as a cataloger, but as a librarian using the materials. And that's yeah. been great. And those folks, like there was one person who works on, um, who works on, edu who focuses on educational resources. And like those folks who have subject expertise have been really helpful with expanding the homosaurus vocabulary and doing the um, vocabulary expansion suggestions. Um, so that's been super cool too. Yeah. Are we, we still have uh, plenty of time for more questions. I, I see. Yeah. I, I guess you're reading it. Like, uh, are you accepting other volunteers or do you have to be within, I guess, the Orvis cascade, uh, rubric or community? That's an interesting question. I don't know why we couldn't accept volunteers who weren't in the Orbis Cascade Alliance. I don't think, I mean, I don't see why that would be a problem because we aren't, we haven't said like, oh, if you're a non-catalogger who's say a student at the UW, you can only work with the UW catalogers. Like they're the only ones who can edit the records that you suggest. Although we do have like Crystal's worked really closely with some graduate students in the high school there. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think maybe it's a, maybe we could have a discussion with our uh, incoming cataloging standing group to see like, how, you know, how are things going? Is this a point to be able to open it up to non 
Alliance folks who are interested? I don't know that anyone is in a position to turn down free help. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we haven't considered, we, we do accept early career cataloging volunteers um, from within the Alliance we have. We haven't considered from outside the Alliance, but we're definitely open to it. We would just have to ask if that was okay. Yeah. Yeah. And our, our cataloging standing group is going to get going at the beginning of November again for our year annual or work for the year. So, yeah. 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 It's been really fun. We've actually, we did a capstone project for a iSchool student and um, taught her to catalog at the same time. It was really neat um, from this project. I'm we just called... making a note to bring this up at our yeah yeah um oh how did you call for participants that's a good question i think we sent it i mean we sent it out really widely across the alliance to um so we have different what are called program areas so shared content and technical services is kind of the umbrella area where cataloging sits, but we also have um, systems, which works with discovery, diversity in user experience, resource sharing, and then um, what I call unique materials, which would be like archives and special collections, but then also digital materials. And we just sent the call out to all of the people on those lists and our kind of overarching announce list for the Alliance, inviting people to participate. So that's how we got people within the Alliance. I know, Crystal, you did work getting, like I said, some iSchool um, involvement at UW. Yeah. yeah. I begged on everywhere within UW. Um, and people were interested. Mm -hmm. I think we got good response. When people hear Homosaurus, they're like, I want to help. I want to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's a pretty easy sell. Okay, well, thank you both for a really interesting presentation on a really interesting topic. Um, I should also note, since there was a lot of interest in getting involved, uh, that the two present there the two lightning talks this morning um, on Homosaurus did uh, one was from Joseph Dudley, who I think is on the editorial board, um, and he talked uh, quite a bit about how you could. Uh, get involved with that community and with that work. Um, so that group is also open to new volunteers if you want to help out on that end. Um, uh, I believe we dropped the link just to, to the General Homo Source page in the chat and in the Slack. So check it out yeah. there and get more information and maybe uh, have a look at those lightning talks. Um, uh, the other lightning talk was by Ernesto Cuba who talked about a project to translate Homosaurus into Spanish um, and, uh, you know, what that entails and how it's not as much like with uh, this project of um, it's not as automated as you would think. Uh, there's a lot of layers and a lot of complexity. Um, so if that's in your wheelhouse too, they are interested in folks helping out with the Spanish translation and maybe other translations too. So. Uh, definitely uh, reach out to the Homosaurus board, um, check out those two lightning talks um, in the YouTube space, um, and uh, yeah, well, you know, it's a great project and a really interesting uh, effort at Orbis Cascade and kind of all around uh, uh, in this effort. So thank you, Rose. Thank you, Crystal. Um, I think we are going to transition now into our next session. Um, so yeah, stick around. Uh, it's the same Zoom. So if you're interested, uh, you don't have to get out of the Zoom and follow a new link.